All right. I hope you brought a Bible. I think it also is important. I know not every pastor uh, likes this, but I do. I love when people have a pen and a paper. Um, sometimes I go through an awful lot, and I can only pause for so long, um, especially after that cake auction today. I feel like um, I feel like an auctioneer, so I am ready to go tonight. I am ready to go a thousand miles an hour, and uh, I got a lot I'd like to cover tonight. And we're going to use uh, a lot more scripture than I even normally do. Um, I want to get this thought across, but um, in chapter eight of Romans, uh, chapter eight of Romans, we're going to be uh, this evening. Romans chapter eight. I quote this one and Romans chapter 5 an awful lot uh, because I love them. They mean so much. Now, we give a lot of, um, I, don't, I don't even know the, the word to use for it because I feel like it's going to come across the wrong way. We, we talk about God and we talk about Jesus and we should, but sometimes we don't give the right attention and the right uh, glory to the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And Romans chapter 8 is talking about the Holy Spirit. I've, I've titled Romans chapter 8 as we go in tonight, the great privilege, the great privilege, the Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of us. Every Christian should know this chapter chapter and know it well. Every Christian should know this chapter. Now, chapters 1 through 8 are, are fairly, uh, they're, they're wonderful, they're incredible. Chapters 9 through 11 get a little more complicated and will take a little time to get through. And then chapters 12 through the end, as we finish the book, we're going to see how to practically live the Christian life. But in order to practically live the Christian life, we have to understand what the Christian life is. And the Christian life is when somebody determines and changes their mind about the direction they're going and turns to Christ, and then the Holy Spirit comes to live inside. And sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as this mythical being. We think of the Holy Spirit as this, uh, you know, just somebody out there. Yes, I know he's part of the Trinity. We fail to understand he is God and has the power of God and lives inside of us, okay? We're going to discuss the Holy Spirit quite a bit throughout this chapter. The Holy Spirit is introduced and really shown what impact the Holy Spirit has on the believer's life. So I don't know how far we'll get in, but I'd like to, I'd like to jump right into Romans chapter 8. More than any chapter in the New Testament, this chapter details the gracious work of the Holy Spirit for redeemed people. Um, those who belong to the Father because they were purchased by the Son. One pastor said they're now empowered by the Spirit. Okay, so we are belong to the Father. If you're a Christian tonight, this ought to get you excited. You belong to the Father because you were purchased by the Son, and now you're empowered by the Spirit. They all work together. They all work together, the Trinity. So let's pick up in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no what? Condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So let's pray, and then we've got to go back to what Paul was talking about in chapter 7, and then we're going to see some wonderful truths that you and I can take. Okay? Remember, much of your life is lived in the mind, the mind, what you think, and that has to be controlled by the Spirit. We'll talk about that. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we need you tonight. God, we need you to do a special work. I pray you'd give us a special comfort tonight like we've never had because we understand just a little bit better. Lord, I pray that you would give us clarity from your word, and Lord, we would take these truths not only as just something out there, but we would take these truths to heart and see who we really are. In Jesus' name, amen. In Romans chapter 7, once we've seen, we've been introduced to justification, to sanctification, a holy lifestyle. We've been uh, shown this idea of a lifestyle living for him. And in chapter 7, we see what the law cannot do. And now at the end of chapter 7, Paul's like this. Man, the things that I want to do, 
I don't do. And we see the practical side of it. We talked about this a couple Sunday mornings ago. We talked about the practical side where you and I can relate. Some people believe the end of chapter 7 was written by Paul about the fact before he came to Christ. I disagree. I think that's written after Paul came to Christ because he continues to talk about the battle of the flesh even into chapter 8. The battle of the flesh. And you and I can relate. How many of you struggle? How many of you have good days? And how many of you had bad days serving the Lord, right? We have a struggle that's going on. One person said it this way, when you get saved, you're given a new body. But you have the old body, the old corpse, if you will. Some person, uh, I don't remember who I was reading, but they discussed the idea of going through life with a, uh, a corpse on your back that's rotting, that's uh, death, that's nasty, that's disgusting. That's the old man. You're the new man. But you still have to deal with it. You still have to deal with the flesh. I want you to see my position in Christ Jesus. So he talks about this. I delight to do the right thing, but even though I want to do the right thing, I do the wrong thing. I desire to do good things, but then I fail and falter. Look at verse 24. Before we can go into chapter 8, you remember... Paul did not put in chapters and verses. Those would come hundreds of years later. So let's continue what Paul is saying. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Okay, that old corpse, who will deliver me from that flesh? That when I want to do good, my flesh doesn't want to do good. Man, it's a constant struggle. When I want to have a clean mouth and clean language, my flesh brings up my old language. When I, I want to have good thoughts, my flesh brings up the old thoughts. When I want to do the right thing, my flesh brings up the wrong. There's a struggle. So notice what he says in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. So then, with the what? The mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The battle is done in our minds. Now look at chapter 8. So this is what Paul understands, this great privilege he has. There's an awareness. There is therefore now no what? There is no condemnation for the believer. How do we define the believer? To them which are in Christ Jesus. Look at me tonight. If you are a follower of Christ and you are born again, you are in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus is in you. In spite of the fierceness of the battle, in spite of the fact we consider ourselves uh, to be wretched like Paul is saying, I owe wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me? This is the conclusion he comes to because he's fighting this battle with the mind. I have no condemnation waiting for me. Oh, what a wonderful thought to them who are in Christ Jesus. You will never be condemned. I want you to picture, if you will tonight, you standing before God. When I ask someone if they knew Christ, uh, sometimes I'll use this term, not every time, but sometimes I'll ask them if you stood before God and God were to say, why should I let you into a perfect place, what would be your response? It's a hard thing because one day we will stand before God not to enter heaven because that's been dealt with down here. But if you were to imagine this courtroom and you were standing before God and God were to show you all the evidence he has against you for being a sinner. And if no sins in heaven, what would you have to say? Would you answer him and say, I am guilty or I am innocent? Well, if any one of you had, you know, if any of you husbands had your wife standing there and told on you for everything, be honest, you would have to say, I'm guilty, right? If you stood before God and he showed a video of your life, you would be embarrassed, humiliated, and shocked in front of the holy presence of God, and you would have to say, I am guilty. I am guilty. I am guilty. But... As Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is accusing me, guess who's standing there? Jesus Christ. Nail prints in his hands, nail prints in his feet, 
The righteousness of Christ is placed upon me. So the only way, I want you to take comfort in this thought, the only way that you would ever be damned to an eternity in a lake of fire is if God sent his son to everlasting damnation. And God would never do that. Because you're in Christ, Christ is in you. Does that make sense? Does that give you comfort? The righteousness of Christ has been placed upon you. You are his child. Oh, there's a confidence and there's a comfort that I do not face condemnation. This is such good news. You will be victorious. Even though it feels like you're a wretched man and you're going back and forth, we have a great privilege because of, if you're taking notes, write this down, my position my position, which is in Christ. Take your Bibles, go to a few passages you know well, but I want you to look at these with me tonight. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know these verses, I want to look at a couple of them. Verse 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay, go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, just a couple books over, or just one book from 2 Corinthians. Galatians chapter 3. Look down at verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. I am placed in Christ Jesus. That is my position. That is why there is no condemnation. This is why I firmly believe and I firmly stand upon the idea of what we call eternal security. I do not believe that you're in Christ, but if you do enough bad, you're out of Christ. And then if you do enough good, you're in Christ. I don't believe in that. I don't believe you get saved and unsaved and saved and unsaved and saved. I don't believe in that. I believe when you are truly born again, and I do believe there are characteristics that would define being born again. We're going to look at them in just a moment. But once you're born again, you are in Christ and there is no condemnation. Now, when he goes on to say, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, absolutely, those who are in Christ walk after the Spirit. Now, we'll talk about this here more in a minute, but let's go to 1 John, if you would. I want to look at 1 John for a minute tonight. Okay, 1 John. People always say, well, you guys, you people who believe in eternal security, you just believe you can live any way you want. Well, I believe most people are not truly genuine believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't believe that everyone who makes a claim to be saved is saved. I don't believe that. Being saved is turning to Christ, okay? Being saved is not adding Christ to a life of wickedness and wretchedness and just doing your own thing. No, that's when you got to study 1 John. Go to 1 John. We're going to look at several of these verses in 1 John. He's talking to believers. He does say if we have sin, we can confess our sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. But the believer will enjoy fellowship. Look at 1 John 1 verse 3. That which ye have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father. Look down at chapter 1 verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth. The believer walks in light not in darkness. The believer confesses sin. The believer obeys God's word. Go to chapter 2. Look at verse uh, 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we what? Let me show you a key to tell if someone truly knows Christ, not that they'll keep them perfectly, but there's an awareness, there's a desire. If somebody does not desire to keep the commandments of God, guess what? They probably don't know him. 
Now, if there, I, I, you know, we, I'm not saying that Christians uh, don't ever, uh, you know, uh, neglect the commandments and live a different way. But if somebody does not care about the commandments of God, stop saying how much of a Christian they are. Let's keep going down. Uh, I know people don't love that, but that is so important, friend. Not everyone who claims to be a follower of Christ is a follower of Christ. We're going to look at a test a little later. There's a test. Go down to uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse uh, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The believers, uh, you should love God, and that should characterize them. In 1 John chapter 3, there's several of these. Go to 1 John 3. And every man, verse 3, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. They're characterized by doing what is right. The believer seeks to maintain a pure life. The believer sees a decreasing pattern of sin. Uh, go to chapter 3, uh, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man do Deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. They are not characterized by their sin. They are characterized by their relationship with Christ. There ought to be a distinction. Friend, I, I, I believe this wholeheartedly. I, I, the idea that somebody can just say, well, I prayed, so now I'm saved, and there's no fruit. Well, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily believe that. As a matter of fact, I would, I would fight against that. When somebody gets saved, there's a few things I personally am looking for in them. I'm looking, do they care about the Word of God at all? Do they care about the family of God, the church, at all? Do they care at all? Do they care about uh, growing and obeying the commands of God? I'm always looking for those things. You say, Pastor, are you the ultimate judge? No. No, I can't tell you if people are saved or not saved. But what I can show you are there scriptures in the Bible that can show us, man, does this person have any type of love? Is there any change in their heart for the things of God? I... I, I Paul knew this. Paul understood that he was in Christ and there was no condemnation. Go back to the book of Romans. That was just, you know, you don't even have to pay for that stuff. That was all just free today, all right? The genuine believer should be characterized by a life following Christ. Why? Because you were made a new creature and the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. Now, there is a difference. Don't go around and be the salvation police. There is a difference between being a baby Christian. They haven't learned. They haven't been taught. I understand that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying, if they're, who did they turn to? If somebody claimed to turn to Christ and yet they have no desire to follow the teaching of Christ, wouldn't some bells go off in our head? I'm not teaching lordship salvation. I'm not saying that if you don't stop all of your sin, all of a sudden you're not saved. That's not what I'm teaching tonight. But I'm saying there ought to be something there. Amen? We don't believe it's just pray a prayer and you're saved right around here. We don't believe that, right? Okay, I need a bet. I need some help or else I'm in the wrong church. We don't believe praying a prayer gets you into heaven, right? Amen. All right, good. I, I was hoping we're in the right one. We don't believe in that nonsense. That's garbage. What we're looking for is people who, by faith, turn to Jesus Christ and trust him. Now, so we see my position in Christ with Paul. What he understood was, I have no condemnation. I have nothing to fear. Isn't there a sense of calm and comfort in that? I don't have to fear death. I don't have to fear hell. If I died tonight, everything would be okay. Amen? There's therefore now no condemnation. Now, let's look at number two. The law is fulfilled in me through Christ. Pick up in verse two. For the law of the Spirit, uh, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, look at that word in, uh, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. 
the idea of the function of the Spirit, the law, if you will, the function of the Spirit, the function of the Spirit in verse 2, if you look at it, that word law, let's, let's kind of use this word function, the, for the function of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me what? Free from the function or the law of sin and death. The Spirit gives life. Law detects sin. God's law detects sin. Amen? So when you look at the law, it tells you if you're a sinner or not. If you break this, you're, bra you're sinning. The law detects sin, but you don't need someone to detect your sin. One pastor, I thought this was a really, it maybe sounds corny to you, but I thought it was really cool. He said the law detects sin, but we need somebody to defeat sin. Okay, so the law, the function of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he makes me free from the law or the function of sin and death, which only detects my sin. It sets me free from that. Look at verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God... Sending his own son, it's almost as if God knew, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Uh, the, the, the idea of law is the, the law of Moses uh, or a universal truth, if you will. I think that's more what's talked about here in these verses but we're free from the law of sin and death. The function of the Spirit gives us freedom. The Holy Spirit who comes to live inside of us. The law can guide us. The law can teach us. The law can tell us about the character of God. It gives us a certain standard, but we are unable to attain it. The law cannot change us. Why? Because I'm the problem. I'm the sinner. The law can do a lot of things. When you read the law, it can convict you. The law can show you where you've fallen short, but the law cannot fix you, right? The law can show you what you've done wrong, but the law cannot fix you or change you. It cannot change me. So what is Paul talking about here? He's speaking to the flesh or to fleshly men. The law cannot defeat your flesh or your sin. So pick up in verse 4. So he sends Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh, not sinful, not sin, but in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Why? Because who are we in? In Christ Jesus. But they that are after this, or excuse me, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He talked about that back in verse 1, at the end of verse 1. God gives you a standing of having met every requirement of the law in Christ Jesus. So when someone is born again, they've met the requirement because Christ paid the penalty. Christ appeased the wrath of God. So even though the law condemned you, faith in Christ cleansed you. Now go to 2 Peter, if you would, chapter 2. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Say, Pastor, why do you use all these verses? Because I believe if we only see it in one place and we're not looking around, I think we got to be careful with that. I want to keep us out of trouble. I want to really use the Bible. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Nope, that is not the one. There we go. <laughs> As I just gave that speech. Oh, boy, it's embarrassing. Um, let me see where I was. Never mind. We're going to go back. So as we use the Bible, <laughs> know the Bible. All right. And we got the wrong one. I'll find that another time. God gives you a standing, uh, having met every requirement of the law. In Christ, you are good enough to go to heaven. In and through Christ, you are good enough to go to heaven. So what is Paul saying? I have no condemnation. And now he's explaining why. Because of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We have a standing before God. We've met all the requirements. That's why when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, we are not going to be judged according to our works to see if we've done enough good to get into heaven. That will happen at the great white throne. Why is that? 
because they've not fulfilled the requirements of the law. They will stand before God based on their works. That's why I believe in the lake of fire there will be different levels of pain and punishment because God is a just God and God will just judge you fairly. I don't believe in the idea of purgatory. You go because, it, you know, I know what they teach and what they believe that you'll go to a place because you don't have enough good yet, so you'll go there and suffer, and then eventually you'll get to heaven. I don't believe that. I believe when you stand before God at the great white throne judgment uh, time, and you stand before God, God will look over your life, and God will judge you fairly, and you will be cast out of his sight. Why is that? You've not fulfilled the obligation of the law. But you and I, what have we done? In Christ, when God looks at us, he sees his son, and we fulfilled all the obligations. Oh, what a wonderful thought to be a believer and a follower of Christ. The law is fulfilled in me through Christ. He gives me his righteousness. The end of verse 4 gives a description of someone who has the Spirit. Let's look at the end of verse 4. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I don't believe that's the requirement that's saying what will come as a result of it. The course and direction of my life is directed by the Spirit. Amen? Does the Spirit direct us once we've been saved? Absolutely. So therefore, that's why he's saying there, this is not the requirement. If you don't follow this, this, and this, you're, not, you're still under condemnation. No, he's saying as a result of it, you're being directed by the Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he's directing you. Amen? Do you ever grieve the Holy Spirit? Sure. Sure. Do you ever, uh, as we read this morning when we said to please God, do you ever not please God? You know why you don't please God? Because you're not following the Spirit. Let's pick up in these next few, next few verses. Even though he's directing us, sometimes we still uh, you push him aside and ignore him a little bit. Let's read these next few verses very quickly tonight. Uh, let's look at Paul's test to see if one is walking in the flesh or in the Spirit. Let's pick up his test here. So in verse 5, he's going to show us... Not, uh, the, not defining if you're saved or not. He's going to show us what happens here. Look at verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is what? It only brings death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Life and peace. Paul's test to see if one is walking in the Spirit. I believe this is a descript description of how one can tell if they are following the flesh or the Spirit. Now, we already read earlier this morning uh, in verse 8, so then they that are after the, or then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We already saw that if you've never been made alive, if you've never been regenerated, you cannot please God. But we find here Paul's test to see if one is walking in the, the spirit. The flesh and spirit are a battle in the mind. Let me ask you, which one is having preeminence in your life? It's a battle of the mind, okay? You didn't just wake up and decide to do something. Your mind's been wrestling with that. And what you're doing, you're giving into the flesh instead of the spirit. There's this battle. Remember, he's continuing his conversation from chapter 7 down into chapter 8. I want you to go to Matthew 16. Hopefully, I got the right one here. If we had two in the same night. Oh, boy. Matthew chapter 16. Look down at verse 23 and tell me how Peter is operating. Now understand the, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, has not descended. But you tell me if this is something carnal or spiritual. Look at chapter 16 and verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. Why was this such an offense to Jesus? 
because in verse 22, Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be uh, unto thee. You remember, Jesus is telling them what's going to happen, and Peter's like, hold on a minute, that's not going to happen because I'm not going to let it happen. And what Peter was doing, even though he didn't understand it at the time, even though maybe he had the right heart or the right motives, but Peter was saying, I am not going to allow God's will to be done. Is that flesh or carnality speaking? That was Peter's flesh. That was him saying, Jesus, you're my friend, and nobody's going to lay a hand on you. I'm going to protect you. Well, what if it was God's will for Jesus to be killed for the sins of the world? Peter was speaking out of a fleshly mindset, and you and I can, we have to be careful, because the world is characterized as a carnal mind or carnality, and sometimes you and I take on that character, even though the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, and he's directing us, and he's guiding us, sometimes we allow the flesh to be the, the main speaker in our lives. Sometimes we allow the flesh to be the one that's guiding and directing, and that makes mentality is the mentality that cannot please God. This is Paul's test to see if someone is walking in the spirit, the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23. Verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Carnally minded, the mind of the flesh. So what is Paul talking about with the carnal mindset? He's talking about the mind of the flesh. The reason we feel so defeated, the reason we feel so scared, the reason is because we have allowed ourselves to think in the flesh. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples of how the flesh thinks, okay? The flesh focuses, and these are not all bad things, okay? These are not all bad things, but here's a test to know if we're thinking in the flesh or in the spirit. The flesh, on its own, without the Holy Spirit guidance, here's a few things that will come that we'll focus on. Violence, material gain, our physical well-being our welfare, uh, sexual, uh, power, money, recognition, almost like the people at the Tower of Babel. All man cares about our physical needs in the flesh. A carnal mind is not functioning based on what God thinks and God's will as his baseline. He is thinking, what is in it for me? Now, is there anything wrong with, you know, trying to do better and trying to have more things? Absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes we get this carnal mindset and we forget the spiritual mindset. Let's go back and finish uh, verse 6, if you would. For to be carnally minded is what? What does a carnal mindset bring? Death. Death. Back in Romans chapter 8, verse 6. But to be spiritually minded is life and what? Paul is saying there is a difference, there is a distinction, and sometimes followers of Christ go back in their mind to the time before they were saved, and they start to think with this carnal mindset. Don't be like them. You are acting like you don't know him when you have a carnal mindset. And carnality leads to death. The power in the Christian life is from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and being spiritually minded. I love what one author wrote. Uh, he said it this way. This is somebody who's possessed. Don't stop there. <laughs> He's possessed, controlled, or dominated by the leading of the Spirit. The life of the Spirit is spiritual life. We sometimes uh, see spiritual things as uh, less real than material things, don't we? Because we can't touch spiritual things. We can't feel spiritual things. But we can feel 
a hundred dollar bill, material things. We can feel a new car. We can see it. We can feel, yeah, Brother Brian just gets a new car and here I am bashing on it. We can feel new houses and we can feel new tools and we can feel new purses and we can feel new shoes and we can feel new clothing. So it's real to us. And that's sometimes where our carnal mindset leads us to. Because the spiritual realm, even though it is so real, sometimes because we can't see it and we can't necessarily feel it, we kind of push it aside. And that's a carnal mindset. And where does a carnal mindset lead? To death, destruction. Okay? Uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, you don't have to turn there necessarily tonight, but that's the fruit of the Spirit. What does the Spirit bring? We can't touch it necessarily, but this is what the spiritual realm does. The Holy Spirit leads to love, joy, peace. This is learning, knowing, and understanding God. Look at verse 7, and we're going to have to be done tonight. Because the carnal mind is what? Okay, so if you're focused on material things, and that's all you're focused on, that's against God. God wants you to be possessed, controlled, and dominated by the leading of the Spirit. For uh, Look at the end of verse 7. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind doesn't care if he is surrendered to God daily. So let's do a test. What is the most important thing when you woke up today? What was the most important thing that you had to do? Don't answer it out loud, but I want you to think about it. I do want you to have an answer just in your mind. What is the most important thing when you woke up today that you should have or should be doing? What is the number one most important thing? Is it important to get up and uh, drive and have a car? Sure. Is it important to make sure your bills are paid? Sure. But the number one most important thing for somebody who claims to be a follower of the Holy Spirit should be this. I have to walk with God and I have to fellowship with Him. Everything else is next. But the carnal mindset says this. I got to get up, I got to provide I, you know, depending on who you are, I got to provide, I got to get to my job, I got to make a meal. Uh, talk about making meals. My wife was in the kitchen and Lucas came out last night and he said to Quest, he said, Why is it that you're always in the kitchen and dad's not? <laughs> Quest said, You want to answer that? I basically said, Lucas, if I was in the kitchen all the time, you would be much thinner. <laughs> um, we'd be eating out a lot more. What is the most important thing for us to do today? That's to walk with God and fellowship with Him. That's to grow in Him. And for us to say anything else is just as important or more important is the carnal mindset. Now, does everything else have to be accomplished? Yes. I'm not saying, uh, you know, comfort, fun, making money, taking care of my family. Those are all good things. But that is not the number one priority. That is a carnal mindset. And carnality leads to death. The number one thing we have to do today is walk with God and fellowship with God. The number one thing you and I have to do tomorrow is to walk with God and fellowship with God. The number Number one thing we have to do on Tuesday is to what? Walk with God and fellowship with God. Why did God create Adam and Eve? God had them and God walked with them and God talked with them and God had fellowship with them and then they disobeyed God and left the garden and didn't want the fellowship that they once had. One day that perfect fellowship will be restored when we're in heaven, but we desire material things. We desire fleshly things. We have our focus on these types types of things and that is the lifestyle and the mindset of the carnal and those who cannot please God and yet sometimes Christians have that mindset friend you and I need to remember the number one most important thing that we have to do is walk with God and fellowship with God everything else is second now, I believe when you do that, God will give you a good balance. You'll be able to take care of everything like you need to. But I truly believe this wicked carnal mindset is coming into the church and is coming to Christianity. It's all about stuff. No, no, no. 
if my number one priority is to walk with God and fellowship with God, I'm going to make some changes. That's my number one priority. Not other things. My number one priority is that. Friend, that is the spiritual mindset. That is the mindset that the Holy Spirit is leading you in. So let's do a test tonight. By what you did today, what was the most important thing to you? Starting this morning till now. Go back through your day. Would you say you had the carnal mindset or the spiritual mindset? Friend, I'd strongly encourage you to consider how we're living, what we're doing, because there are things that are enmity with God. Those are things that are uh, displeasing to God. It ought to be, what is my number one priority? Heavenly Father, God, I love you, Lord. And we see through this, uh, the obviously, Lord, the carnal mindset, the one who is fleshly following the flesh. And Lord, we know the world does that. But we as Christians should be distinct. There ought, we ought to be different. And God, we see some of these realities, and sometimes we go back to uh, that, that mindset before we knew you. God, before we knew you, we weren't even able to bring you glory. And now that we know you, we can choose to bring you glory, or we can choose to have that carnal mindset and be so busy focused on all these other things. Lord, maybe tonight each one of us would say in our heart, we need to make the number one priority to walk with you and fellowship with you throughout our day. And God, I know that will bring life and that will bring peace. And Lord, it's so much better than the alternative. We wonder where our joy is. We wonder where our peace is. And God, I believe it's because we follow a carnal mindset. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to to make some changes tonight in our lives and in the way we live. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. Tomorrow night, we'll be, uh, ladies' Bible study will be here, and uh, we'll have our prayer time at 5 o'clock.